Ladies and gentlemen, it is a great honor to welcome our final speakers for an in-conversation uh, session, which I will be moderating, hopefully with an extremely light touch, uh, the Right Honorable George Osborne and Professor Neil Ferguson. Thank you very much. So I'm going to hopefully just leave the two of you to talk amongst yourselves for, for, for most of this, but um, I wanted to start with saying something that not many people here realize, which is that the two of you are actually professional colleagues, that you're both fellows in different capacities at the Hoover Institution uh, in Stanford University. And this is actually one of the reasons we wanted to get you uh, here to get today, because you're, you know, Neil, obviously based in America, but with an eye on, on Britain, and George based in Britain, but very much with an eye on America. So it felt like a, a sort of a, a nice sort of symmetry there to, to have you talk about that relationship. And one of the themes which has come up throughout today essentially is um, the same thing that, Neil, you addressed in your Sunday Times column uh, just a couple of days ago, which is of, of shrinkage, of the fact that this is clearly not the greatest time there has ever been for the US or the UK separately. And I suppose the question I'd like to start you off with, um, and then please feel to be free to just sort of go on from there is, is this a, a sort of speed bump or a, or a permanent, uh, per, you know, a permanent uh, impairment? I mean, are we, are we witnessing an interruption of the um, sort of US, UK model economy dynamic, or are we witnessing something sort of more lasting and dangerous and damaging? Well, shall I go first? Please. I, I used the term shrinkage at the end of my Sunday Times column uh, to, to make the point that if we're in something like Cold War II between the United States and China, which in some respects we are, the trade war, uh, the tech war, and increasingly the geopolitics of the US-China relationship, the US probably doesn't have as many friends around the world as it thinks it has. Uh, and certainly many fewer than in Cold War I. And that's one consequence of, I think, uh, a subtle erosion of the alliance system that there has been. I'm not uh, overwhelmingly negative about what that, the, the Trump administration is doing. The main point of that piece was to say that it was quite effectively using foreign policy with respect to China, quite effectively using it in the Middle East. Uh, but I worry a lot about the transatlantic relationship. And I worry about it as much because of what is happening in Europe uh, as because of what is happening in the United States. At the recent uh, Bilderberg meeting, I found myself wondering, how can it possibly be that in a recent German opinion poll, a majority of Germans said they regarded the the United States is a bigger threat to their security than Russia, when the security of the Bundesrepublik has been dependent on the United States since its inception. Uh, I think the transatlantic relationship, we'll, we'll leave the British part of it aside for a minute, is not in great shape, and it's not all Donald Trump's doing. There's a very striking anti-Americanism abroad, especially in Germany, the most important European country. And that makes me worry that while we fixate on the European Union and Britain's relationship with it in this country, the real problem is actually NATO and the ambivalence of the major members of that alliance. George? Um, well, first of all, nice to be here. I think this is the third time I've uh, spoken at this conference, uh, and it, it's good to be back. Um, and, and you're right, Neil and I are both um, uh, fellows of the Hoover Institute. I put in about two weeks a year, and he puts in 52 weeks uh, a year, which is why he's better dressed than I am. Um, <laughs> but um, but I, think, uh, I think there are a number of things you can identify that has seen the West and the UK as part of the West um, shrink its um, ambition in the world. Um, there are a set of big historical events that have happened. The intervention in Iraq, which was the thing that dominated the first few years when I was an MP. Um, so we now have a rather odd debate inside my party, which is we want to spend billions of pounds more on defense, but we don't want to use any of these 
things were buying for anything other than patrolling the North Sea. Uh, and then uh, the financial crash, which accelerated essentially the development of China as the, uh, a dominant, you know, the, a, one of the dominant economic forces uh, in, a decade ago. And then the current situation where, you know, I'm not going to argue in this room about the merits or otherwise of Brexit, but I think everyone can accept it's enormously energy sapping and consuming for the UK and has not really created any space for us to think about a wider role in the world. And at the same time, you've got problems inside the European Union itself, and you've got an American president who, whereas where I agree with Neil, has done some good things that he doesn't get credit for, nevertheless is because he's fundamentally unpredictable, he's not always a reliable ally. And so the kind of linchpin of the Western alliance since the Second World War, which is America's got your back, is something that many in the West now question. If you were the Estonian government, your entire security relies on the fact that if Russia invades you tonight, the 101st Airborne is going to be there tomorrow morning. And frankly, Estonia is not entirely convinced that that's the case with this president and this administration. And, and of course, he's a product of, of a shrinkage that began under Barack Obama and was also born of uh, financial crisis and uh, overstretch in the Middle East. But that is the reality of the world we're living in today. And you know, if you were our opponents, if you were sitting in Beijing or in uh, Moscow, and I wouldn't equate them, I think you know, China can be a, a, a potential partner in stability, but nevertheless, you'd definitely be feeling our influence is growing, whilst uh, those who perhaps uh, you know, we are up against, is, uh, their, their influence is diminishing. But obviously there's an economic dimension to this as well. Well, I mean, the biggest event of modern history, of our lifetimes, has been the transformation of, of China. And when you think about how dramatically uh, that changes the balance of power, it's, it's clear that the rest of our lives will be, will be spent in some measure grappling with the new reality. A, a generation of Americans, Democrats and Republicans alike, assumed that it was good for the United States for China to grow, and it was. Uh, it was good, however, not for all Americans. And I think if one looks back, the moment that China joined the World Trade Organization in 2001 was a turning point. From that point on, the benefits of what we called rather casually globalization, i.e. the rapid growth of China within the world economy, predominantly went to the Chinese who created a new and vast middle class and 1% of Americans. And the median household simply didn't see any of the upside, or at least insofar as there was upside in the form of cheap consumer durables, they did not see it as justifying the loss of, uh, of skilled manufacturing jobs. So that's the big trend of our time. It's something I wrote about back when I was writing Civilization. And I think that we still haven't figured out what the implications of China's rise are for Europe. It's clear that in the United States, what Donald Trump did was to articulate what many ordinary Americans were feeling, which was enough already. We can't simply acquiesce in a country that is still a one-party state becoming number one. When Trump launched his campaign, let's think back uh, four years to that initial launch in New York, he was ridiculed. I can remember Arianna Huffington saying that she was going to cover the Trump campaign in the entertainment section of the Huffington Post. He seemed a complete maverick for calling into question the US-China relationship and for threatening to impose tariffs uh, on China. That seemed like crazy talk. Today it is consensus in Washington DC. It is one of the few bipartisan issues in Washington today. The other one is, is bashing the big tech companies. But there are no other bipartisan issues. It's a remarkable transformation, and I think it's right to say that, that Trump initiated it, he was the catalyst for it, but it is now like a consensus across the policy community, uh, even at a university like Stanford, where it's true I spend rather more time than George, but we're always glad to see you, George. It's, it's an issue on the campus. Do we have a problem uh, of sustained espionage within uh, the academic community. 
that's a problem for the entire University of California system too. So it's clear that the United States is in the midst of a major shift from the acquiescence that I think had become characteristic uh, in the Obama administration in its final years after the pivot to Asia had kind of been abandoned to something which is reminiscent of early Cold War containment or whatever term you want to use. I don't think Europeans know what their role is in this uh, nascent Cold War II. There's deep ambivalence on the continent, that's clear. If you think about the way that the big German uh, businesses, particularly car manufacturers, think about it, they want to be, uh, they want to bet on China. That's, for them, the big market of the future. So I think part of the ambivalence that I see in Germany about the Atlantic relationship represents as a reflection of the, the attraction of the East in raw economic terms. And here I'm, I'm going to mention an insight uh, that Henry Kissinger had, uh, whose biography I'm in the midst of writing. He said recently, and I think it's very true, that if Europe doesn't change course, its fate could be to be an appendage of a Chinese-dominated Eurasia with the United States as an offshore balancing power, a very different state of the world from the one in the Cold War when the United States was fully engaged in Western Europe, not an offshore balancing power, but an engaged presence in the construction of, a, of an Atlantic alliance. So I, I feel that the puzzle is actually Europe. I think when you come to London, you find that British politicians are the subject of every sentence uh, and the focus of every headline, right down to their domestic tiffs. But Britain is not the subject of every sentence. It hasn't really been since Article 50 was invoked. It's really up to the 27 what happens next, more than it's up to any of the two remaining candidates for the Conservative leadership. But for Europe, it's not even the most important question. It is not the most important question for the people who are going to take over the commission. What do we do about Brexit? There are much bigger problems coming down the pike. What do we do if there is going to be a Cold War and the Americans say, no more Huawei? Do we simply roll over? Or, as seems increasingly likely, do the Europeans say, we hear what you're saying, but we, we can deal with Huawei. So just leave it to us. I think the future looks like a future in which there are a lot more non-aligned countries, including most of the EU, than during the Cold War. That's what I meant when I said shrinkage. You'll suddenly find in Cold War II that most of Europe wants to be non-aligned, except maybe the Poles and the Baltic states, and every, everybody else is essentially saying, you know what, the Belt and Road Initiative, kind of interesting. I mean, the Italians, for example, a good illustration of this point. Populism is a word that gets used an awful lot, rather casually, by people who generally haven't studied its history. One striking feature of populism in the European context is the sort of attractive quality of Russia, an attraction which is not always unrelated to financial support for populist parties. These are the trends that are really interesting to me because they constitute an erosion of the Atlantic Alliance that was so central to Margaret Thatcher's worldview and to Ronald Reagan's. It was something that I suppose the Hoover Institution spent a lot of time thinking about and working to support in the 1980s. And now I worry that what we are looking at is an extraordinarily fragile edifice that a single challenge could cause to collapse. Going back to something George just said, what if Putin at some point decides to exercise the option? I think he has an option to challenge Article 5 at some point during the Trump presidency. And that option will expire either next year or four years later. But the temptation must be very great to expose the fragility of NATO by taking action uh, against one of the Baltic states and seeing if actually NATO is a rotten edifice. I worry a lot about that because in some ways I can't imagine him letting that option expire unused. I mean, I, look, I, I would start by um, hesitating about immediately assuming or indeed wanting or willing us to be in a, cold, a second Cold War. You know, most people in this room, like me, grew up during Cold War I and uh, we were close to destroying ourselves. It didn't happen, but, but it was a 
fairly scary confrontation. Um, and I think the kind of strategic competition with China is nothing like the presence of a million Russian soldiers on the border of uh, West Germany and the positioning of nuclear weapons to destroy us and, and vice versa uh, at a moment's notice. So, I, you know, I, I kind of hesitate about that. I also think, you know, if the, here at the CPS, you know, we, we should acknowledge that the power of the free market has transformed the lives of hundreds of millions of Chinese people who, when I was born, lived in the grinding poverty which their family had lived in for, for time immemorial, for thousands of years, to uh, an emerging middle-income country with a large and growing middle class, and that some of the most innovative bits of the Chinese economy have been the bits that have been least controlled with by the state until now, like the tech sector, um, and the bits of China that look the least um, futuristic and the least threatening and the least um, kind of exciting are the bits that the state still runs, like the heavy industries and the state-owned enterprises. Um, so it is, a, you know, the China has been um, a, a test bed for the ideas of the CPS, and it has delivered a huge amount of prosperity for hundreds of millions of people. Um, of course, with that has come, with economic power, has come growing political power. And essentially, the post-war settlement on the other side of the world, not here in Europe, but which was that the American fleet guaranteed the security of post-defeated Japan, East Asia, is fraying uh, because there's a very big country in the neighborhood, the longest enduring civilization on the world, China, with over a billion people, with potentially in our lifetimes the largest economy in the world, already the second largest. And it is not happy, just as, by the way, we wouldn't be particularly happy if we were Chinese, that the American fleet sits off its shore and says we're in charge of this neighborhood. And so it's starting to assert itself um, and probe it, its powers. It's actually behaving a bit less rashly than Britain and America did when we had all the power in the 19th century. I seem to remember something called the Monroe Doctrine, where America just unilaterally declared no one could interfere in its hemisphere. Uh, and of course, Britain went and you know, colonized places and seized places. That's not really how China behaves. You wouldn't want to be you know, one of its near neighbors at the moment. That's an undifficult uh, balancing act to get right if you're Vietnam or uh, the Philippines or whoever, or Japan. But we're not that. And so, you know, we, we, ever since Dennis Healy withdrew us, we, are, we are, do not have uh, a, a responsibility for the security of East Asia. You know, the British fleet isn't there. And maybe in seven years' time, I'm going to send an aircraft carrier there. That was, was what I read the British government was planning to do. But until the aircraft carrier is built and reaches the other side of the world and can be properly protected on the other side of the world, um, you know, we don't have that responsibility. And I think we do have a responsibility because of our history and because of our future interests in trying to sustain the multilateral order that we put together after the Second World War with the United States. Institutions like the United Nations, the IMF, the World Bank, the World Trading Organization, and so on, uh, and indeed NATO. And uh, many of those institutions, you know, which I spent six years of my life sitting in long, boring meetings at, you know, have a value because they are the, the escape valve, the kind of pressure valve, which allows a discussion to happen at the G20 rather than a confrontation. Um, and some of what China wants is perfectly legitimate. You know, they wanted a bigger role at something called the Asia Development Bank, because they're the largest economy in Asia. And a combination of the United States and Japan shut them out, wouldn't let them have a bigger role at the Asia Development Bank. And as a result, they went and created something parallel called the Asia Infrastructure Development Bank, and no one's ever going to hear again at the Asia Development Bank, and everyone wants to be involved in the AIIB, the Chinese question. So those were missteps by the United States, by its allies, that we didn't allow space for legitimate Chinese ambition to play a bigger role in the world. Uh, and I think we should you know, find ways to, for, to channel that. I think we should go back and say, well, what could we do to give China that bigger role in a way that is, that is peaceful, that is cooperative, and that fundamentally uh, understands that they have a, as big a stake, if not more, in global stability than anyone. Because the biggest threat to the Chinese Communist Party would be is global instability, financial crisis, and uh, conflict in Asia. 
uh, and they think a lot and think long and hard about the, st the survival of the Chinese Communist Party. So I, I think we should, um, you know, we, we've got to try and manage this better, frankly, than we did in previous generations. I know, you know, it's a, now a well, um, well rehearsed argument, but it's worth repeating the, the Graham, Professor Graham Allison work on the Thucydides trap that the world's not very good at managing big emerging, or in this case, re-emerging powers. And before we just sign up to the kind of Pentagon plan or the Trump plan or the Democrat plan or whoever it is in the United States, their plan to junk 50 years of US doctrine on China and suddenly rush into a confrontation which I don't think they have the appetite for, the stomach for, the resource for, the coordination for. You know, we, sh we as America's friend and ally, and indeed more broadly I would, I would argue we should act in a European uh, context in this regard, we should say, well, is there an alternative to a headlong rush to a Cold War II? But what both of you seem to be des describing is a world kind of quite different from the one that, you know, when you, when you think of the 80s, Thatcher and, and Reagan, in which, you know, the, 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 the kinship between Britain and America was an ideological and political sort of driving, driving force in the world. I mean, Neil, you're talking about a world where essentially, you know, you, you probably want you, you know, the UK has, should get behind America in this new, in this sort of, in this new confrontation. And, and George, you seem to be talking about a world where, frankly, you know, the UK doesn't have much of a role to play, or, it, or, or at least it's not, it's not sort of. No, I, I, sorry, I, I think Britain can play a very big role in helping shape the West's response to China to actually providing a bit of a counterbalance to the assumption in Washington that it has to be a confrontation, to trying, but obviously made much more complicated by Brexit, to lead a, a common European response mm -hmm. uh, to things like the Belt and Road Initiative so individual countries don't get picked off. I think there, there's a very big British role and a big under, and, you know, that, and we are, as one of the uh, presidents of the creation of the international order, we, 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 can, we can shepherd it. Unfortunately, that is self-evidently not in our capacity at the moment because we're going to spend the next 10 years arguing about our relationship with the European Union and in hung parliaments and, you know, whatever. But that, you know, unfortunately that is the case. But that doesn't mean, you know, in the spare amount of time allowed for other things, we can't think about these wider issues. I, I have to say, I think, George, that that... that ship has sailed, the idea that there can be some kind of middle position played by Britain and or the EU uh, was certainly plausible a few years back when, when you were still in government. I think it's become much, much less pl plausible since 2016. I think it, it, it's going to be very interesting to see what happens at Osaka. Of course, with the president, you can't quite predict at all what he's going to do. He likes to tease the other side by promising long talks, by cancelling Vice President Pence's speech, not once but twice, a speech which was certainly going to be extremely hard hitting on the issue of, of China and human rights and political and religious freedom. So we don't know. And it could be that the, the President calls Cold War II off and does a beautiful deal on trade with Xi Jinping, I wouldn't bet on it because I think that that deal is a very, very long way away from being doable. Well, we, one thing's for sure, uh, just to interrupt, he, Please interrupt he, each other constantly. He, you know, one thing's for sure, this guy wants the American economy on fire next autumn, right? He wants it, but, you know, he wants it really strong. And he has discovered an instrument that can, that he can turn off and on, which is his predictability or unpredictability. So he, he can strike a trade deal with China in the early part of next year so that by November, the economy is, you know, because right. that, that lifts a great uncertainty. But where I think you're right is in a way the Trump trade arguments and, you know, his relationship with Xi and the G20 or is, is sort of floats above a bigger shift right. in the United States, in the universities, in the military, in the different political parties there in the Congress that sees China as the, the big strategic Absolutely. threat. So you and I sit in all these, we quite often end up at the same events, Neil and I, and we sit in all these meetings and everyone says, you know, America's got to lead the world in AI and we've got to lead the world in 5G and we've got to lead the world in genomics. And what, you know, that is the conversation you get in the kind of American security tech community. Um, and that is sort of irrelevant to the Trump trade deal, which I would put a bet on being done 
because he needs the economy flying by uh, uh, next autumn. I think that's exactly right, George. That's what I was going to say, that in a way it's not really about the trade war. It's much more about the tech yeah. war. And I think there is indeed a structural shift in the United States, which is cross-country and cross-party. And whatever Trump does with respect to trade won't alter the direction of, of travel, which is important when you think about something we haven't discussed, which is, which is Five Eyes. One of the things that one hears little about and reads little about, but which is hugely important in the world, is the intelligence cooperation between the United States, the UK, and the other members of the Five Eyes, and the Anglosphere, if you want to put it that way. And I think that this is going to be a big test of that, because while all other institutions may be in flux, the European Union, NATO, uh, even the WTO, I think Five Eyes remains one of the constants in the world, and it's the thing about the Anglo-American relationship that really matters if you ask the Americans, because we have all kinds of sentimental ideas about it in this country. Speaking now as an American citizen, we are totally unsentimental about the special relationship. We have several special relationships, incidentally. Yours is just one you, of them. Have you slipped into an American accent? I, I, I was about to do it imperceptibly. It would be like one of those uh, doctored videos where I would gradually turn into Arnold Schwarzenegger before your very eyes. But if you That think feels of, less likely. You haven't seen my, my biceps lately, George. The, the key thing to, to bear in mind here is that from the US vantage point, uh, there's no sentimentality attached to it. We just have an extremely important intelligence relationship. But if Huawei becomes a source of trouble on that, and if the Americans say, well, you know, if you guys are going with Huawei, then I'm afraid, you know, the Australians and, and we are not going to be called, taking your calls anymore, then that's a major problem. That, that's actually the much, to me, that's the most important issue that is coming down the road for the US-UK relationship. It's interesting that Five Eyes is, is so central to this. It was in many ways the Australians who started the, the wake-up call. It was the Australians who, who first called out Chinese influence operations in Australia long before uh, anyone in the US was really thinking about it. And only recently, our colleague at Hoover, Larry Diamond, published an important report on influence operations uh, in the US, which was closely modeled on what the Australians had been doing. I was in Sydney not so long ago, and eminent Australian politician said to me, you have have to understand that we had this dilemma. Our economic interests were for a good relationship with China. But in intelligence and national security, we had to have a good relationship with the United States. And it was a no-brainer. We, we didn't really have to think too hard about that choice, and it was clearly going to be option two. I think the UK is heading towards that kind of dilemma as the US-Chinese relationship but, but just, to, just to, to move us away from China um, briefly, I mean, George, the Five Eyes, I mean, surely a much more likely threat to the Five Eyes Corporation is Jeremy Corbyn, who would probably be slightly more likely to share intelligence with Vladimir Putin. Well, I was it. actually, you, you, uh, yeah, you correctly anticipate where I was going, which is, I think, you know, I don't want to speak for the intelligence agencies, but I, I was very lucky to come across them and work with them when I was in government. You know, and I think their challenge is going to be working with, you know, one of the potential challenges is working with governments. You know, we already know, look at the United States, the rows about the FBI, Donald Trump, what he sees, what he doesn't see, and all of that. And of course, there would be a kind of question here. Um, you know, we've never had a government, we've had Labour governments, Conservative governments, we've had a coalition government. We've never had a government, you know, who's, who's sort of avowedly led by someone avowedly anti-West and anti-intelligence and anti-security. And that is a big challenge for the British state, were that to come about. And um, with a conservative majority of three at the moment, mm -hmm. uh, well, once, once you know, the Brecon and Radnorshire by-election passes, but certainly an odd decision to select the candidate who um, has been convicted <laughs> of expenses fraud. Um, once, you know, government majority of three with the DUP, no other combination in Parliament, you know, you would think that at least there's a kind of a election is quite likely. Um, so, yeah, it's a big challenge for the British state. But the British state, you know, is a, one thing... I went to an amazing um, um, a memorial service last week for Sir Jeremy... Lord Hayward, as he was in the last couple of days of his life, but Sir Jeremy Hayward, the Cabinet Secretary... And you did see all these brilliant people who work for the British state, the Home Civil Service, the Diplomatic Corps, the intelligence people, the um, military, and indeed lots of 
British businesses that have helped, and, and indeed lots of politicians from different governments there. And you know, the British state has got a lot of resource. And, and you know, it, can, it, can, it will f be thinking how to deal with this challenge um, and, the, and the challenge which the Conservative Party has thrown it on Brexit. So, it, um, you know, it, it, it is, I, w I would have some faith in it. No, I mean, do you, do you, do you I, mean, what, what, yeah, I mean, what's your take on Britain's sort of domestic politics, admittedly from a slightly more distant vantage point? Well... It's looking great, isn't it? <laughs> I um, hesitate to uh, opine on this, but it seems clear that, as, as George has just said, the probability is not trivial uh, that the Labour Party will, will win the next election. It might not win an outright majority, but it would certainly be in a position to form a coalition. There are many ironies at the moment in, in, in British political life. One of the biggest is that even as the country has grappled with the issue of Brexit, its politics, its party politics, has become more and more European. Uh, a multi-party system in which the only viable governments in future are likely to be coalitions uh, looks uh, very like a continental European uh, landscape. And I can't see really how uh, any of the wonderful things I'm told are going to happen with Boris Johnson and the Prime Minister can happen. I, I always enjoy magical thinking. I've heard a lot of it in the last couple of weeks. Magical thinking about how the Europeans are suddenly going to modify the withdrawal agreement. Magical thinking about how a credible threat of a no deal is going to be made. And, and magical thinking about how at the end of all of this, the Conservatives are going to win an election. And the only way the Conservatives can win an election would be if the Brexit party were dissolved and Nigel Farage gave uh, an endorsement uh, to the Conservatives, which isn't really the way that the populists tend to behave if you follow the populists in other European countries. What they actually tend to do is to acquire and then grow their share of the right-leaning electorate. So I'm deeply concerned. I share uh, George's fear about what would happen if we had an election imminently and uh, Jeremy Corbyn became Prime Minister, a man wholly unsuited to, to that role, who's been wrong, I think, on almost every issue of my political life, except maybe apartheid in South Africa. Uh, and the probability of this as the ultimate end station of the Brexit uh, agony is, is something that I find relatively... I don't think it's the ultimate end station, don't worry, there's more agony after that. Well, of course, but it, it's, it's clear that one of the consequences of a coalition with the Lib Dems and the SNP would be another referendum and very likely the whole well, enterprise of Brexit being aborted. That seems like... No, no, a you have to... Look, right you have to you know, I'm a member of the Conservative Party, and I, for many years, was a Conservative MP. You know, how have we ended up in a situation where the only alliance we can do in the Parliament is with the Democratic Ulster Unionist Party? I'm not against the DUP, and I like some of the people in the DUP, but that is our only option, right? When I was sitting in the room with David Cameron, and we had fewer MPs than the Tory MPs than there are now in Parliament, we said, we looked at the situation, we said, we have got to go and get ourselves a chunk of MPs to give ourselves a majority, right? And we went and formed a coalition with the Liberal Democrats, which was seen at the time as extraordinary, uh, unstable. Many people in the Conservative Party didn't like it at the time, but it gave the government that I was part of a majority of 60 or 70, so that when I got up and gave one of my budgets, I was pretty certain that most of it, not always, you know, I tried to, you know, shouldn't have tax pasties, but apart from that, they, you know, <laughs> my budgets were passed. And the education reform that Michael Gove produced was passed. And by the way, the things we delivered for London for Boris Johnson was passed. They can't pass anything. There's not a single thing of any controversy that could possibly pass in this parliament now. Yeah, now there are good MPs in the audience, I can see, and, and, and Graham there, and, you know, he will, uh, I hope, confirm this. There is no majority. So they can't do anything. It, it, it doesn't, I mean, of course it matters who's the next chancellor and everything. I'm not saying it doesn't, but that chancellor has no power to deliver a budget that has any kind of lasting reforming impact because there's no majority to pass any of its measures. We, we've ground to halt on public service reform because you couldn't possibly introduce an education reform or health reform bill into this parliament. Uh, and, and let alone the Brexit legislation. 
I mean, we are only in the foothills of the Brexit legislation, but this was supposed to be the beginning, which is, you know, pass the withdrawal agreement, and then, then there are a series of bills that need to be passed, and then we can think about our permanent relationship with the EU. You know, we haven't even got to that stage, the past sort of the first base or maybe second base. And, and so that is a fundamental challenge for the Conservative Party. And it, it, you know, as much of it, I'm not saying that the Brexit Party is not a threat. And, you know, I had UKIP to contend with, uh, and I see Douglas there was part of that contention, in 2014, 15. But the Liberal Democrats are on the rise. So if the Conservative Party goes into the next election with the Liberal Democrats anything like where they are at the moment, they're going to get 10, 20 seats. They're only on 11 or something at the moment. They had 56 or 57 when... Nick Clegg was in charge, and, and, um, um, and uh, so they only have to get 20 or 30. That's it. Tory majority wiped, not only wiped out, like deep underwater. Uh, and, and this fundamental kind of pursuit, I'm all for, you know, I was, spent my life running general elections, trying to get the Conservative Party into office, trying to sustain it in office. I'm all for going to win seats in Stoke-on-Trent and Derbyshire, and that is brilliant, you know. And some of those seats that were won two years ago, I never dreamt the Conservatives could win. But we lost Reading, Brighton, Battersea, Kensington, Bristol, you know, uh, you know, whole swathes of middle-class southern England that we worked bloody hard to win back off Tony Blair. And if you think going into a general election, those seats, some of those seats now have big Labour majorities, and they are not coming back to us. And we are, we are trading away prosperous, successful urban parts of the country, if we're not careful, as a conservative movement. Um, and and, and that, is a, that is a massive, massive problem. I edit London's newspaper. You know, there are conservative MPs sitting in London on seats that they just would not hold if there was a general election tomorrow. That's your majority gone. That's Because that's, there's only a majority of three with the DUP. So, you know, I am, now the great thing about the Conservative Party is it is a monarchy tempered by regicide. So, <laughs> once you get a new king in, it will be a king rather than a queen this time, once you get a new king in, they can basically, through their leadership, do a lot to change the direction and the, and the, and the, um, and the way the Conservative Party comes across. And it has got to reconnect with urban, metropolitan, young Britain. In 2015, we won a majority of the gay vote. Inconceivable when I became an MP in 2001. We got half of all the Indian origin population voting vote for us. That is now a fraction of it, what it was in 20, 2015, only four years ago. If we don't do that, if we, if we can't connect to urban metropolitan Britain, we're out for a generation. Can I ask you, George, if you regret not taking my advice. <laughs> <laughs> I always regret not taking your advice. When I, when I urge you not to become a journalist, but to stay uh, in the House of Commons in the belief that every politician has the wilderness years at some point, and you just had to wait for the vindication that would surely come. <laughs> Do you know, the very first event I did after I got fired as Chancellor Exchequer by Mrs. May, um, was here on this stage. I was booked to give the big CPS dinner speech or like the big, you know, this conference. And I was like, really, it's the last thing I want to go and do tonight. <laughs> but, uh, but I came, I was like about two nights, but I came and, uh, and actually, had a, uh, you know, people were very kind to me and it was a great reception. And whatever. Um, I didn't want to hang around being, you know, uh, and I wanted to go off and do other things. And I've really enjoyed editing the newspaper. But, you know, I keep an eye on what's going on. Um, I, I, I think we could listen to the two of you talk for, for quite a long time, but um, I know, George, you have to get away and presumably edit the newspaper. Um, no, we do that in the morning. <laughs> of course. Um, <laughs> but can I, um, so can I just close by asking each of you for one reason to be cheerful? Because we've, we've heard a bit of pessimism. Oh, yeah. I can so, give you three. So in the last year, when you're just for population, Fewer people have died of hunger, fewer people have died of disease, and fewer people have died in, of violence than at any previous year of human history. And the principal reason for that has been the expansion of free market ideas, uh, which were pioneered by this think tank. That'll do me. Well, me too. So <laughs> I'd like you all to join me in thanking so much George Osborne and Neil Ferguson. Thank you.